first presentation at SAFI, it was very biological, looking at racial ethnic differences in response to exercise. And I remember Bill raised his hand and he was like, <clears throat> so what role does racism play in your research? And I was just kind of like, wait, what? Because um, again, nobody talks about that in my field. It has absolutely, you know, we bring people into the gym, put them on the treadmill, take their blood, see differences, ooh, it's genes, or ooh, they don't exercise. Um, so this whole social environment stuff, I mean, I thought it was really cool, and I, but that was not my training at all. Um, but then I, you know, I was involved in Safi, I was listening to what people were saying, you know, unnatural causes came out, um, probably six months before I defended my dissertation, I was like, nobody cares about exercise, who cares? Even if we got the whole world exercising, there'd still be these disparities. So I had like a little, uh, yes. And so, um, but it was great because every year you come, Bill, Kamara, Chandra, all these people that study this and have a deep understanding of what I wanted to get at because I was very much interested in health disparities. My junior year of my undergrad, I raised my hand in the class and said, wait, why does that black bar of hypertension, why is it two or three times higher? Am I gonna get this disease? And my teacher literally just said, mm, I don't know, you should go to grad school and find out. So that's really all the help I got in kinesiology from in terms of health disparities. And when I would send, during my dissertation, when I would send, like, say, oh, there's all these differences, none of my advisors would believe me. So I literally had to go back to Bill and Kamara and look, cite all their research to bring it to my advisors to say these differences are real. And, um, but it was also interesting at that time, you know, just trying to figure out, like, I had the Safi voice, the public health, social epidemiology voice in one ear, and I have all these biological scientists in another ear. And it was, again, I went on for my first postdoc at USC. It was still very biological, but I happened to be um, sharing an office with a stress physiologist. And the stress physiologist was actually putting mechanisms to what Chandra and Kamara were saying inside the body. And I was like, oh. And then I remember having dinner with Chandra one time, and she says, well, if you really want to do health disparities research, you need to go do another postdoc with Kellogg Health Scholars. And I said, another one? My dad's going to kill me. I need a real job. Um, <laughs> she was like, you need to get real training in, in uh, health disparities if you really want to make an impact. Because there's a lot of people doing race, ethnicity research. But you know they're just looking at differences, and that's where the money is. And so don't be one of those researchers. Um, so I did a second. <laughs> no, but that's real, and I appreciate it. And again, it changed my whole life. Um, so I did a second postdoc with Kellogg Health Scholars at UCSF and got to meet and work with Lynn Sign and got to work with um, Paula Braveman. So people who, I mean, li literally Lynn like handed me the social epi book and he said, read the whole thing and come back to me if you have any questions. Okay, and, he, and then he was like, if you tell me about another park that you want to build a park, you kinesiologist, I'm gonna scream. Um, so I was like, no, 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 I, I understand a little bit. I just don't know how to measure it. And so during those two years, it was, again, bringing, bringing exercise physiology, stress physiology, social epidemiology, all together to then bring a research agenda to where I can not only study the problem, but try to find effective solutions to the problem. And so I credit all of that to Safi because Come on, never looked at me like I was crazy when I just didn't understand what they were talking about. And from that, moving on, I meet so many students who had the same questions that I did 10, 15, I'll only pick myself, uh, a few years ago. Um, so I'm able to train people in a multidisciplinary fashion. I'm able to, at Michigan, they allow me to teach classes. So I teach a class called The Role of Social Factors in Shaping Physical Activity Behaviors. So we talk about racial discrimination, residential segregation, and that SAFI was uh, the organization that helped me when I was at UMass to develop a curriculum around uh, the social determinants of physical activity behavior. So it really helped me put my training together and then train a whole new class of students um, who can, and they actually, um, even with the current state now, they can see a lot of the social determinants even more so than before. So if you need any glimmer of hope, all of my, when I ask them, we, you always get to the racial discrimination lecture, but, and the different levels, do you think this still exists? They'd be like, no. But now they're like 100%. Like, how do we change this? 
Um, and so I, I just credit Safi with all of that. Um, another thing is uh, for me, I was um, working on this during a time when I was first a postdoc and then a junior faculty person on a tenure track. And uh, that was challenging. <laughs> <laughs> However, one of the, uh, there were several benefits to that. One is that my network of uh, friends, supporters, colleagues was much broader than my immediate institution, right? So while a lot of folks do their service, you know, a lot of faculty members do their service in their local area. There's Dr. Jenkins. Hey, Bill, come on. While a lot of folks do their service, I feel like I should just pull Sorry. <laughs> this is all you hear about. Um, it doesn't afford, it, it, once I went up for tenure, then I realized that the networks that I had established, in part through SAFI, were helpful because people uh, knew me, they, and I knew them, and I knew who to reach out to, and those kinds of things. The other thing is that we started really trying to support and encourage students to apply um, for scholarships and present their work, you know, really think about how we can reward our students uh, for their scientific endeavors. And so actually a number of my students or people who weren't actually my students per se, but that I had interacted with through phone calls like Brittany talked about or, or so forth around the country, submitted their work and it was really helpful and rewarding personally to be able to see that next generation um, presenting their work, asking the important questions that they have um, in this really intimate environment. Do you want to um, bring Bill in? I definitely will. So, Dr. Bill Jenkins, he is a founding member of SAFI, so you can tell them, you know, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> um, and as, as he stated just now, he's everywhere. So um, he was faculty at UNC, he was faculty at Morehouse, um, he was the Associate Director of Research and Health Disparities um, at Morehouse College, um, and he's really developed and shaped the field in terms of like social equity and this idea of racism. So I will cue you into the next question. Uh, can, I, can I answer oh, that question? Okay, so my answer to the question of how Savvy has shaped my career has so much to do with Bill, so I'm so glad that you're here. Um, the research part was not just Bill. The, the research part was just feeling that there was a home for, for my work and for the questions that I wanted to ask and that it was legitimate to not talk about race but to talk about racism. So that was the, the kind of validation every year. But the leadership part was following Bill and everything that he's done. So, <laughs> so following Bill to the executive board, following Bill and so many different leadership roles is just to have a person that you know who has done these things which makes it really possible and what you guys who are sitting here should know is that if you want to be president of APHA then you can be president of APHA right and if you want to know the how then I won't talk about it now but you know pull me aside and say well what the, the general how is become involved in your sections right now become very involved. Go to your section meeting. If you never even uh, went to a section business meeting before, if you didn't even know sections had business meetings, go this this meeting. Look in the back of the book, find out when at least one of them is, and then you go and you say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm a student, I'm a postdoc, I'm a whatever, and I am really interested in becoming active in this section. And people will fall off their chairs because people are begging, <laughs> they're begging people to become involved. So maybe they'll ask you to help with the newsletter or something like that. Or maybe they'll say, well, do you want to be our action board representative? Or maybe whatever. And then after that, you get elected to the section council, which is just local in the section. And then after a few years of that, then you say, well, I'd like to be a governing councilor. Right, so can you get to the governing council? And the other thing is, um, I want you guys to know that you can go sit in the back of the governing council meetings right now. You can walk in and out. You know, you know, there's some chairs in the back to see how is policy happening because APHA is a scientific meeting, yes, but it's also a policy meeting. It's a full-time policy meeting. There are going to be 
public policy hearings on Sunday afternoon from 3.30 to 6 on all the things that might become resolutions of APHA. Um, there's, you know, there's all this stuff going on. So anyway, the long story short is to see somebody who had gone through all of this stuff, that we can mentor up and down in this room, and that's the real promise of Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I will pose the next question to you, um, to everyone, but if you would start us off. What do you think the legacy of Safi is? Or what your legacy was? Yeah. Um, well, Safi sat out with three basic ideas. Uh, one is to uh, further the research on what we had just uh, started calling health disparities. Um, about 27 of us met at Spelman College um, talking about this gap. That was the initial phrase that unfortunately I came up with. And then smarter people said, no, let's call it out disparity. So I'm <laughs> glad of that. Um, and um, uh, so it had three prongs. One was to affect policy. And the way to do that is to focus on getting involved in organizations. We. Uh, <coughs> Set, uh, got people on the executive board of APHA, ASA, American Statistical Association, American College of Epidemiology. Um, we decided to make sure that we could, with very small number of very well disciplined people, we could make an impact on organizations that up to that point had never had African Americans on their boards before. Um, it is amazing what can be done with a relatively small group of disciplined people. Um, the second um, idea was to uh, do uh, increase this research on what we were calling health disparities. If you were to do a medline or whatever young people do today, um, and you will and, and you put in uh, time, uh, health disparities over time, you will see that health disparities started coming up right around 1991 and then continued to increase the papers on health disparities. And that's because people were uh, contacted to focus uh, on this particular issue. Uh, it was surprisingly um, easy to do, I think, uh, to get people to do research. Uh, it's gone a little bit off track, uh, but I think it's, that's where it started. Um, and then the third thing, um, you know, was to uh, involve and encourage and train uh, or mentor, I guess that's what I should say, a cadre of young people. Uh, I've said this before, you know, when I got my doctorate in Epi, there were three black people on the planet with the doctorate in Epi. That's crazy. And um, what we did was to create institutions that um, would change that. Uh, Public Health Sciences Institute, we created the first MPH program at Moas uh, School of Medicine and then encouraged the development of MPH programs at seven other uh, HBCUs. So that was the plan and we effectively did it. I think that we've had uh, people on the executive board for more than 20 years now. Um, and it's a, like I said, it's amazing what could be done with a relatively small group of disciplined people. I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question. The legacy, that's what you said. I, I think the legacy is carried on in those areas. Because uh, when we go to scientific meetings now, you see young African Americans who are doing uh, public health science, um, and you see some policy changes. Uh, and if there was ever the need for regenerating uh, work on policy, it is now. Uh, there are people who think the Civil War and slavery ended in 1865. It did not. <laughs> you know, it is still, it is still here today. Those people who do not work against Confederates in 1865 will not, are not working against Confederates in 2017. 
they're still Confederates. You know, they may call themselves social conservatives or whatever you want to be, but they're the same people doing the same thing in a different time, in a different environment, but the struggle is the same. And you have to decide whether you're going to say yes and masa or whether you're going to stand up and fight. And that's a decision that you're going to have to make. Uh, and I am absolutely in love with Donald Trump because nobody lays out the, the clear disparities in where we are than him. It is absolutely clear. You cannot um, just say, well, I didn't know, or, you know, because he lays it out there. It's, he's a wonderful person. <laughs> I think that uh, the importance of institution building is the legacy, but you can't just build an institution and then let it sit. An institution is like a shark or something, you know, like it has to keep moving and keep being fed. You know, there has to keep being a circulation through it. So we could say that our legacy is the fact that we have so many people and so many posters around this room. When I walked in, I was like, look at all the work that's being presented right here in this meeting. Plus, I don't know how much other work is going to be presented within the APHA, formal things, when, when that gets started. But you can't just sit back on your laurels on that. And so it's going to require you all to become the new leaders. You know, you can't, you can't think, oh, Sappy's great, we're done. It, because it will fold. It will become nothing. It will collapse into dust. So. The legacy is an opportunity. The legacy is not a structure. We have great structures now, bylaws and invitations and student roles and all, but the legacy is an invitation to take us to the next level and to at least keep it going. And whatever the form, you know, in 25 years, it won't look like this. But it, it, as long as it's something, keeping true to our mission, then, then, then you will have made the legacy live. Otherwise, a legacy can die just like anything else. And I think that one reason why that theme has come up over and over again is because that has been very real for us over, over time, that we, we each have had to struggle with making sure that we do keep something in place to make sure the legacy is strong. Um, I think that uh, I really agree with what you were saying about the policy, and I'm, I'm kind of actually very excited about the original vision. Because when we worked on the 501c3, and really Dorothy Stevens did a tremendous job with that, um, getting the 501c3 status approved, um, our goals aligned with what you had in mind originally. And so I think in terms of thinking about legacy, that suggests that policy, uh, the way that we wrote the 501c3's um, mission for Zafi had to do with doing a combination of research and education. We didn't want to call it, you know, lobbying or anything. Right. But, uh, but, but, so I think from a social structural perspective that that, that will help to shape what the legacy is for, for Zafi going forward. Um, and I did want to just add a point to what you were saying, Kamara, in terms of this not just being a place to show up and soak up, but being a place to show up and get involved. Um, and I remember, I don't remember who said it, but I remember one time that a fellow SAFI member said some, at, a, at the usual re, uh, annual reunion, because it does feel like a love fest every year. <laughs> wow, everything just works out somehow. <laughs> and it, it works out because there are people behind the scenes doing the work very quietly. So um, that's, that's to the point of dust. I think um, in terms of the legacy, I don't think we'll ever fully be able to measure Safi's legacy because the, the roots just keep, or the vines, or the leaves, branches, just keep growing. And they grow outside of public health, and they're growing into other fields. For example, in the American College of Sports Medicine, we, as the chair of the special initiative on health equity, we just wrote a position paper on, and actually Sonia Hutchins reviewed it um, because there's a CDC person on it, but how do we achieve health, achieve equity and physical activity participation 
um, to then help to achieve health equity. And it sounds very fluffy, like who cares about physical activity, but the same social determinants that determine health outcomes also determine health behaviors. And so to have this whole organization that is really wants to, they recognize that we spent 50 years you know, studying exercise and understanding all the benefits of exercise, and only 20% of the population is regularly active. And that's even less for communities of color. And why is that? And so, you know, giving other organizations understanding around the social determinants of health, same thing with the Obesity Society. So Sharika Kumanika, who will be here later on, has done a lot in that area and formed different committees, different organizations, so that social determinants of obesity can be presented. So some of our students presented how racial discrimination is predicting increased obesity in African American youth. So other platforms are being built and being formed in other organizations. And again, I could give Safi all of that credit. Can we get questions from the audience? Yes. Or did you have other questions? But, I, mean, I just have one last question, but it can be a culminating question. So definitely, we can take, um, while I'm figuring out the mic situation, how about this? Can we, so our last question was, as you reflect on the changes in public health overall over the past 25 years, given the mission of SAFI, how do you think that SAFI um, can remain relevant now in APJ? And then I will find a mic. <laughs> I'd like to start out with something a little personal. Um, I, I try, uh, I have tried not to be too close to Safi the last, I don't know, a decade or more. Because in the 1960s, when we were coming up in SNCC, we, um, all these old coots were still running the organizations that we wanted to run and they would move out of the way. Um, and so, and I think it's absolutely important that every generation